Good afternoon and welcome to chapter 12 uh, of uh, this, this series, uh, continuing with uh, visual arts. Uh, and I, I've gone, gone through a uh, series of British artists and sculptors, and I'm going to talk about some photographers uh, a little later on. But first of all, I wanted to do a bit of a parenthesis and look at the Turner Prize. Okay, now the Turner Prize was established in 1984, and it is uh, in Britain the most prestigious prize in contemporary art. And as you can see, it's not just a, a piece of paper. In recent years, the cash value of the prize has been £25,000, so well worth having. Uh, and the competition is sponsored by Gordon's Gin. Now, there's always uh, interesting things to find out in the paratext. Sponsored by Gordon's Gin, you might wonder why. So gin, it's, it's more a uh, middle class uh, uh, drink than a working class drink. It's not, we're not surprised to see that it's not sponsored by beer. Uh, perhaps the beer would sponsor more something like the X Factor or something more uh, directly uh, linked with um, popular culture. So what, what is the Turner Prize? Well, first of all, go, go back to, uh, if we go back to who, who was Turner. Uh, so Turner, one of the greatest um, British uh, artists of the uh, 19th century. I'm not going to give you his biography. Uh, but you can see here in front of you this piece, Rain, Steam and Speed, which is, if you look carefully, it's a train coming over a bridge in 1844. And, and I get the feeling that if you had looked at this, those of you who are not experts in the history of art, and that the date had not been beside it, you might have thought that it was something more modern. Uh, and certainly at the time, it was quite, uh, it was quite um, controversial. Uh, many of the uh, established artists and art critics said, well, it's not finished. Look at it, it's not finished. Uh, and uh, it has since, however, come to uh, be thought of uh, uh, as uh, a tremendous um, uh, body of work, Turner's, to such an extent that uh, the Tate Britain uh, uh, received a, a generous donation of money to house the Turner collection. So there's a whole wing of Tate Britain with um, many dozens of paintings by Turner, the whole Turner section. So he's put forward as really as one of the, the great British artists. And, uh, and that's why they chose when they decided to set up a, um, what's the word, a, a prize for uh, contemporary art, they decided to uh, uh, name it after um, Torn Turner, J.M.W. Turner. Uh, now, I'm going to just present to you a few of the winners and you will see quite quickly, I think, that uh, the Turner Committee uh, likes to reward um, contemporary artists who produce uh, uh, original, but not necessarily easy work for the mass of the people to, under, to, un, to understand. So here is Susan Phillips. There are actually four uh, nominees for the Turner Prize in 2010, and one of them won, uh, and this was Susan Phillips, and she was the first sound artist to, uh, uh, to win. So a sound artist, and so that's something new. Uh, so again, this is with the idea of it being uh, a sort of happening, yeah, an, an event. Uh, and what she did is she chose three bridges in, Gla in Glasgow uh, and sang a sea shanty, a traditional sailor's song. Uh, and this was, uh, this was linked then to the history of the place she was singing in it. Uh, 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 it. Uh, and so that, that was the that was the idea there. So she she sang three different versions of the Scottish lament in three different uh, bridges. Now, I personally don't know enough about the lament or the bridges or the places to understand it. But I get the, the general idea that she's trying to just in a similar way, perhaps that, that uh, Andy Goldsworthy was about building his uh, arches uh, 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 along a traditional route, which everybody had forgotten. She also was trying to bring history back uh by doing this uh, this this the, this event and that won uh, the um the uh, prize in 2010 it was supposed to be linked then uh, to the the bridges which were uh, built during the late 19th and early 20th century when glasgow was the <coughs> fourth largest city in europe after london paris and berlin and the folk traditions of singing were uh, were very active um, so there was there's a, 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 a link there. Uh, 2011. I'm not going to give you every singer. Uh, not not going to give you every single um, 
uh, winner, but in 2011, this was the winner. Again, this is not necessarily very easy. Uh, this is a, uh, an installation, a sculpture, if you like, entitled, Do Words Have Voices? Uh, and uh, the, the 150,000 people uh, visited the Turner Prize exhibition uh, that particular year. Uh, so here we have a little uh, uh, explanation of it in The Guardian, then The Guardian, a, a newspaper rather uh, sympathetic to contemporary art with his quietly atmospheric, lyrically autumnal sculptural installation, recalling a melancholy urban part with its metallic trees and scattered paper leaves, Martin Boyce has been announced as the winner of the £25,000 Turner Prize. Boyce was narrowly the book, book his favourite for the prize, ahead of painter George Shaw, who chronicles the scrubby, dilapidated suburban streets of his native Midlands. 2010 uh, prize was won by a video, the Woolworths Choir of 1979, which uh, uh, re uh, recalled um, a terrible event um, of uh, 1979, when there was a a, a, um, a, f a fire uh, in in, uh, in in Woolworths in in a, uh, a department store, not a department store, in a store. So you can see the different things. Uh, here you get the expiration again. Uh, again, as I say, not not easy, not e not easy work uh, for for people who are not used to looking at um, uh, contemporary art. The focus and drive of Price's work, the cutting and atmosphere mark are out. There are silences, bursts of music, a terrific play of words and images and switches in tempo that take us from an analysis of church architecture to a reconstruction of the fire itself. Okay, so that's the, uh, uh, the, the one that won in 2012. Uh, and uh, uh, the following one then uh, is this piece and now certainly uh, I think we, it's very clear that here we are with high culture because you need to know quite a few things before you arrive uh, and this uh, piece uh, is in fact uh, a um, version uh, of William Hogarth's well-known drawing Mariage à la mode. Now when, when I say well-known I mean well-known among people who are uh, well clued up in art history. So uh, this was uh, then the winner, uh, I can't remember what year, it may have been 2013, um, uh, Lubaina Hemed, and who is she? Uh, an underappreciated hero of black British art. Uh, now she has got, according to BBC News, the recognition she deserves. Her section of the Turner Prize exhibition contains work from the 1980s until today, including wooden figures, pottery and newspapers that she has painted on. The centerpiece is 1987's A Fashionable Marriage based on William Hogarth's Mariage à la mode, which features a cast of cut-out characters, including a flirting Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. So you have there some in there somewhere a flirting Margaret Thatcher and um, Ronald Reagan. These are cut-out uh, uh, card cardboard characters. Okay, so as you can see, this uh, this uh, the Turner Prize is uh, um, solidly on the ground of contemporary conceptual art, not supposed to be easy to people who are not used to all the different things that art can do and so on. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, it, and it is regularly attacked in the conservative press, uh, and indeed uh, it is uh, often attacked uh, uh, for being ridiculous in some way or another, and, and certainly um, uh, the piece uh, by Tracy Aim in my bed was uh, um, attacked on all the uh, the conservative newspapers and on the television. Uh, and the one reaction, this is a few years ago actually, and uh, but it's very interesting because it, uh, it 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 builds up an understanding of what sort of debates people can get in with. Although it only lasted for a a few years, I think. And this is that uh, somebody decided to set up another competition uh, entitled the Not the Turner Prize. Um, and uh, indeed, this was started by the conservative newspaper. This is not the Turner Prize uh, contest, was started by a conservative newspaper, the Daily Mail. And so here you have a little explanation of it. A Burton artist is hoping a portrait of a pal will land him a £20,000 pri prize in a prestigious national competition. Simon Watson is one of 20 finalists from more than 8,000 entries. 8,000 entries in this year's Not the Turner Prize competition, so obviously far more um, than uh, would be in the Turner Prize competition. The competition was started by a national newspaper in protest 
at controversial previous winners of the Turner Prize, which have con included Damien Hirst's Cows Packed in Formaldehyde uh, and a mound of concrete poured into a derelict house. This is Turner Prize uh, judges, and so it goes on to criticize the Turner Prize uh, and uh, 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 to, to suggest that the better idea is this, not the Turner Prize. Uh, and interesting, the panel of people who are going to judge the not the Turner Prize is uh, Lloyd and Andrew Lloyd, Lloyd Webber, the famous uh, um, writer of musical comedies, uh, who also has one of the biggest private art collections in Britain. And the panel who will judge the not the Turner Prize include top artists and Rolling Stones guitarist Ronnie Wood, uh, portrait painter India Jane Burley and portrait a nudes expert, Andrew James. Yes, so we're seeing uh, the word portrait. And uh, I thought you'd be interested to have a look at some of the pictures which have been shortlisted for the Not the Turner Prize. That is the, the finalists, if you, uh, uh, if you like, and you can see at the top left then uh, a painting of boats, uh, a landscape on the bottom, a horse. Um, oh, oh, those, those are the only ones uh, that, that, that I've got here. But it's, it's sufficient to give you a, an idea. That is to say that contrary to the winners of the Turner Prize, uh, these pieces fit very clearly into traditional categories of landscape and uh, uh, seascape and, uh, and, and animal portraiture uh, and so on. Uh, and so this is where the, where the debate goes. Now, uh, it'd be interesting to see where this debate is at now. When I say debate, I mean really public row rather than uh, necessarily an informed debate. So uh, on the one hand, you're getting people, people who are going to this uh, uh, this exhibition and there were 8,000 entries. So there was obviously a certain number of people who support it are saying this is real art. Real art is supposed to be beautiful, uh, uh, works on your emotions. <coughs> And you, you can understand it immediately what it is. Uh, you don't have to um, study or, uh, or uh, work through philosophical context, uh, concepts to get there. Uh, uh, whereas the, the defenders of contemporary arts, uh, even though they might find uh, some of the contemporary art difficult, are going to say, well, the problem with this, the horse and the landscape, is this is exactly what has already been done before. There's nothing new here. This is not going to be, make you think. And we think that one of the main objects of art, of visual art, is to make you think uh, about things uh, in a different manner. So there you get the uh, um, the uh, question of the of the Turner Prize. Uh, and no, the problem is not so much which, whether you like it or not, but to understand where they're coming from. I'm going to move on to uh, a photographer, uh, one of the best known photographers uh, in, uh, in, in, in Britain, uh, born in 1952, uh, and this is Martin Parr. Uh, and he, now photography is a, a, an interesting uh, type of uh, contemporary art to look at uh, because it's uh, placed somewhere there between popular culture and high culture, especially recently, because of course, the number of people who could, who could take photographs uh, has exploded. A uh, uh, hundred years ago, uh, cameras were rather expensive, uh, black and white, of course. Um, 50 years ago, cameras were very cheap and everybody could take them. And uh, 30 years ago, uh, or 20 years ago, you got the, uh, the arrival of the the mobile phone and the fact that everybody can take many photos every day. Now in that situation, in that mass of photos, how do you take photos which people are going to recognize as artistic or about as making you think or as doing something particular and special? These are interesting questions. Uh, and here are some of Martin Parr's work. Uh, now, again, just like other uh, works of art, it, the, there isn't going to be one single uh, uh, straightforward explanation. This is what it means. Uh, but it seems fairly clear uh, that what he likes to do is to look at Britain in perhaps a little bit of a sentimental way, uh, but uh, to look at some of the aspects of England, which might be considered to be kitsch or cheap. Uh, and so here you have two children. I think this is 1960s, yes. Uh, the, the, oh, no, it can't be. He was, uh, he was only born uh, in 52, so it must be the 70s. Um, uh, two children having a good time, uh, but, you know, not, nothing particularly uplifting. Uh, he liked to find uh, colours 
uh, so this appears to be in a in a Chinese uh, uh, restaurant or, or something. You like to find find the colours, what they're eating. Here's another one here, uh, fish and chips being sold at the seaside. Uh, and indeed, I think that these are from a collection of photographs that he made of a seaside resort. Uh, uh, I think it was the last resort or something. Uh, and so he's going around and saying, well, you know, I'm not looking for the most beautiful uh, landscape photograph. Uh, I'm looking for, so this is documentary photography. Uh, it's uh, uh, presenting modern life in perhaps a slightly critical gaze. I mean, it's not, it's not a highly political gaze. He's not going around looking to photograph police brutality or racism or, uh, or sexism and so on. Just uh, um, ordinary people's lives and uh, perhaps uh, uh, slightly mocking at times, but I think in quite a generous way. Uh, this one I like here. I don't know if you can see quite what's going on. They're, they're all sitting on the beach, but it's actually an artificial beach. It's an indoor swimming pool with a picture of, uh, of, the, sea, of, of the, the, the blue sky on the other, uh, at the other side. This is a, something which really exists. Uh, he also liked to take photographs of, uh, of um, what's the word? Factories and so on. Yes, it was indeed the, the last resort was the was was the name of the thing. He also makes films, uh, but there's another project that I wanted to particularly look at, uh, and this was from the point of view of art as conceptual art. That is to say, that uh, I have said a few times that uh, one of the things that art can be demanded to do is to make people think. Uh, and uh, uh, Martin Parr uh, produced this book called boring postcards which is he collected postcards for many many years and he uh, made this uh, he published a collection of the most boring postcards in his collection now uh, as you can imagine if people buy the book then they don't think them but they are boring but they represent something and they represent something about history uh, and something about the history of uh, postcards and of people's view of the world uh, postcards are an extremely popular uh, activity. Even today, millions of postcards are sent every month. Uh, previously, uh, 100 years ago or 80 years ago or 70 years ago, there were far, far more. Uh, I don't know when was the uh, high point of postcards. First of all, people were not so good at writing. Well, of course, they didn't have email and text messages. Secondly, the advantage of a postcard is that you could write something quite small uh, and uh, many millions of postcards were sent, uh, well, 100 years ago, every, every week, there were millions and millions of postcards being sold. So what did he choose as these postcards? Well, have a look at this one then, for example. This postcard was produced um, to celebrate the fact uh, that the M1 motorway had been built. That is the first motorway to be built, built in Britain. And uh, the, why it is interesting to see it in a book today is that today we don't get so excited about people building new motorways. Indeed, from an ecological point of view, we might tend to say, well, you know, is this really such a good idea? Instead of encouraging people to take public transport. Uh, and so this shows, you know, uh, the pride of people at the time. And, and, and indeed, the, the motorways were major engineering uh, victories. Uh, it was very difficult to build them. Um, uh, and so this was a celebration. But now we look at it today and it really seems like a, a moment of time which tells us something about how people's attitudes have uh, uh, developed. There's another one of a motorway, the motorway service station, uh, which now appears to be extremely banal. Um, and reminds me of what uh, Douglas Adams said, that in, in no country is there an expression uh, as beautiful as an airport. Um, and it's similar with uh, motorway service stations. Uh, this one was produced uh, for the opening of the nuclear reactor uh, in uh, Scotland in, at uh, Dunray. Uh, and again, uh, today, well, there are not that many nuclear reactors being opened, but if they are, I don't think they're going to be selling postcards about them, uh, because again, this is something that people were very excited and proud about at one point, uh, whereas today, people either have a negative view of uh, nuclear power stations, or they think they are unfortunately necessary, but certainly that uh, um, naive excitement has gone. Uh, and this one, uh, uh, one, of, one of my favourite ones, is from a uh, holiday flatlets in South Devon. Uh, that is to say, these are small flats which uh, families would hire 
for a week, and it's just next to the sea, to go on holiday. It's working class, this is the working class holiday uh, at the time when only middle class people could go abroad to France or Spain. Now, before that, uh, for, for, for a long time, working class people were, first of all, the weekend at the seaside and then perhaps a whole week at the seaside in these flatlets. And here you can see them with the formica chairs. And it was so exciting compared with the places they lived at home, that there were postcards that you could uh, you could buy. And so it shows, again, it's a vision of a particular moment in history. It's a form of cultural history, if you like. Uh, and it was quite successful, uh, of course, not, not boring, but a kind of, uh, what's the word, a, a sort of generous but slightly mocking view of past attitudes again, uh, looking at social attitudes. Again, here we're with some contemporary art, which is not really difficult to understand. You can like it or not like it, but you're not lost uh, in what the concepts are. And here, what, what does this uh, say about it? Yes, uh, Parr's approach to documentary photography is intimate anthropological and satirical okay that's that's what that's what that's that's what they uh, that's what they are are looking at it was quite successful here you can see the the german edition Lang langweilig uh, post post Carlton. uh and uh, he seems to me to be fulfilling one of the jobs of the artist and that is to find a completely new idea of how to look at, at, uh, at the world. Uh, so again this is very very different from traditional views of art where we're not bothered about uh, uh, virtuosity. The problem is not to be extremely skilled. Uh, collecting postcards does not take a lot of skill. Uh, so the idea it, it's in the in the artist's mind. The artist, if you like them, you think that the artist looks at the world in a new and interesting way. And of course, if you don't like them, you think that the artist looks at the world in a, in a way that doesn't make sense. There's another one of uh, uh, of uh, uh, Martin Parr's photographs. So you can see there they're on the seaside. They're determined to have a good time, but in fact, it's cold and wet because it's Britain. But they're still on the seaside because they're on holiday, so they must be on the seaside. So it's, a, like, as, as, as I say, a, um, a uh, generous look, uh, but slightly mocking. Uh, now, I want to move on and talk a little bit about street art. Um, and for, first of all, some general ideas about the meaning of street art. Why street art? Now, of course, uh, I'm not an expert in the detailed history of street art in Britain. Uh, obviously, uh, it depended partly on the development of uh, spray cans uh, and in general, the uh, different kinds of paints which were available. Uh, it also depended, it seems to me, on the idea that gradually more and more people, a larger and larger number of people, were prepared to say, well, maybe I'm an artist too. But also to do it in the streets rather than in a gallery was to some extent, I think, a rebellion against the idea that, you know, well, galleries have remained very bourgeois. Not the big ones, the Tate Modern attracts masses, but the, the small galleries where, where most artists would uh, if they're able to exhibit somewhere, can I exhibit the long streets in London or Paris of small galleries? They're pretty intimidating. They're pretty bourgeois. Um, there's sort of a very much high culture, uh, elite, elite culture. Uh, and so painting in the streets, first of all, it's free for everybody. Uh, secondly, then you might tend to want to paint in a way which is not difficult for people to understand. Uh, and it, it seems to me that the that street art has many of those characteristics, which I identified a, a few weeks ago as being popular culture. Uh, of course, anybody can do it. Anybody can do it. Anybody can see it. Um, and there you go. So it's very accessible to the public. Um, the choice of street art is because you want to uh, produce uh, art, which is available to everybody. Uh, you identify the public. Of course, you can do it in a poor part of town. Or in a rich part of town, you can choose your audience or, or in the countryside, perhaps somewhere where you can see it from a train. It costs nothing to the public, um, unlike many art museums, although not so much in Britain. It doesn't cost very much for the artist, paints and that's it. Uh, but it does open up questions about how the artist can make some money. Uh, because, of course, although uh, people think of art and they like to think that art is not about making money, but about uh, expressing their soul, if you don't make enough money to buy yourself a sandwich uh, before the next uh, uh, art, you will fairly quickly stop doing it. So there's got to be a way uh, uh, of making money. How can you make money as a street artist? Well, if you get if you become sufficiently well known, uh, you can sell uh, photographs or or or, or uh, 
um, or even the, the, the objects themselves. There is a tradition within uh, street art of using pseudonyms. And again, this is an idea um, that rejects the starification and the glorification of uh, the uh, traditional, um, the, the traditional, what's the word, the traditional art world. Political messages, we will see uh, in a moment where, uh, where, where they come in. Um, aesthetic standards, there are no doubt specific uh, aesthetic standards uh, to be used in street art, street art. And finally, subaltern messages, uh, these are, that is to say, messages from ordinary groups of people from, from um, the black part of town or from the uh, uh, Asian part of town, uh, town in Britain, a deliberate uh, way of saying, hey, this is our art uh, and, and there can be styles which develop within communities of street artists, uh, which, uh, uh, which allow us to look at it in, uh, in, in, in that way. So I'm ending chapter 12 uh, here, but I will continue in chapter 13, talking to you about specific street artists and what things they've done. Of course, most importantly of all, the most famous one, uh, Banksy.